Hello everyone, welcome back to the Green and Mullen Show here on Newcastle Fans TV. Today Sam and I are joined by a returning guest, a man who we love talking all things Newcastle United about. A man the last time we spoke to was talking positive things about the club, positive things off the pitch and positive things on the pitch. And do you know what? Nothing has changed. So we've, we've invited Aaron back onto the show. So it's a big welcome to Aaron Stokes from the Chronicle and a big hello to you. How are you? Yeah, very good, boys. Pleased to be back on. Um, pleased that all my predictions about Newcastle becoming a dominant force have came true since the last time I was on the show. <laughs> they certainly, they certainly have, and we're recording this as Mr. Yassir Al Rumayan was just kind of going through the PIS wealth, and it's it's it was scary in terms of the, the, the size of the numbers back in two thousand and twenty one. Uh, yeah, 2022. Sorry, when the take no, it was 2021 when the takeover got yeah. approved. It seems like it seems like it was a lot longer, but because we've had so many good times. But I have to start off with that question in particular, Aaron. You know, a certain amount before 2025, I, I think like is it a trillion pounds or trillion dollars? Sorry, they want that's what their prediction is going to be, and it could be two to three trillion by 2030. Mind-boggling numbers. Mind-boggling. If we thought 650 million. Uh, Six hundred and fifty billion dollars is mind-boggling. It's going to be absolutely yeah, even crazier than that in the, in the years to come, surely. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know we've all seen the graphs about Newcastle's wealth compared to City and United, and you know how it's sort of blown out the water. And you know Saudi Arabia. I know people who have been over there, and they say the stuff that they're doing out there is just unbelievable. They are really trying to become an absolute you know force, and they've got the funds to do it. So you know. Saudi Arabia as a country is going to get richer and richer. I'm sure Newcastle United as a football club is going to follow suit. Um, so, yeah, I think they're in safe hands. I mean, if it wasn't for financial fair play, we could literally spend like a billion pounds on Messi. Or, but obviously, financial fair play is what it is now. There are sponsorship deals to be renewed, and I'm expecting some newfangled sponsorships for, I don't know, training socks or something official training third kit gear sponsor or something because that's what they seem to be doing at the minute to increase that revenue um what are you expecting from this summer we'll come on to signings and stuff later on but from a commercial standpoint yeah look you, you've hit the nail on the head that the recently they've done a lot of sort of small deals peter silverstone who's came in as the as the cco is as you know worked his magic on that front but you know, deals with Monster Energy for stadium presence aren't going to, you know, reinvent the wheel when it comes to the money that it's going to bring in for Newcastle. So um, the big one, you know, is getting rid of Fun AA. I think that is, you know, whoever they choose to be um, the new kit sponsor, which could be this summer, you know, if the Premier League bring in rules um, regarding gambling sponsorship and stuff like that. Um, Darren Eels has obviously spoken about, you know, potentially selling the name and rights to St James Park, which I'm sure would split opinion. But we've seen, you know, elsewhere, it's a huge revenue driver for the likes of Arsenal and, and Manchester City. And then, you know, um, potentially further down the line, when this cast ordeal ends, you're probably going to look at, you know, Adidas returning. Um, Darren Eels and Silverstone have got, you know, fantastic relationships with Adidas from their work at Atlanta and their work at Arsenal. So I think in two years' time, the entire football club sponsorship-wise will just look, you know, completely different. It's, it's it's funny you should mention the fun eight because that was my my next question in regards to that because you're quite right from reading what the Premier League would like to do and it looks like it's going to go ahead is that gambling uh, companies won't be sponsors on the on the on the shirts of football clubs which obviously would eliminate fun eight eight obviously we've had other companies over the years I think Wonga was the one that sticks out over the Ashley years if I'm being honest but. I think Sam is quite right. It is very interesting to see who we go with. I think obviously Saudi Airlines have obviously been mentioned. I think it obviously will be something Saudi Arabia based. Of course it will be. Um, but you mentioned that the naming rights as well, St. James's Park. Now, I think that will split opinion. I, I'm, I don't want St. James's Park to be changed. And I always, I would always know it as St. James's Park. However, if it was, for example, St. James's Park powered by Monster Energy, for example, I would, that would be the that's kind of like that's kind of, that's like oh. as an example. That's my limit. That's my limit. It has to, it's, if it's something like powered by whoever the sponsor is. That's my personal. Powered by. I don't know what your I don't, I don't know what your personal opinion is on this, Alan. Uh, if I'm honest, I think I'd prefer to go back to Sports Direct Arena rather than it be the the Monster Energy Arena. But um, 
No, look, I, I think I think as I said, it, it will split opinion. Um, the one thing I will say is that I think the club will do it, you know, very sensitively, as they've done with stuff like safe standing and, and tickets for the final. They'll go to the fans and they'll sort of put it to, you know, not a vote, but they'll go and get opinions as to whether, you know, there's the appetite for it. Is there going to be sort of a big rebellion against it? Nothing like what we saw, you know, nearly a decade ago when Mike Ashley just sort of, you know, did what he wanted it and changed it um, without any say. I agree, you know, with you, Johnny. I think to me, it'll always be St James's Park, um, and I think for as long as they stay in that venue, which you know it looks like they're going to do, it'll be St James's Park to everyone. I think the only reason you know Arsenal have, have made so much money out of it is because they moved to a brand new stadium. It was a brilliant opportunity to, you know, bring in 60, 70 million every season from it. Um, so yeah, very. I thought it was very, very interesting when Darren Hills actually came out publicly and said that they were they were considering doing it. I would buy. <laughs> the sponsor in the electric. It just doesn't make sense. But that, I, I, I'm like Hughes. I don't. I don't like it. But the difference being is this time, like obviously when Mike Ashley did it, he was doing it for himself, and and for peddling his tat. Whereas this time, you would expect it to be to generate revenue and have that commercial aspect for it, which I can kind of get on board with, but. It, it doesn't make it doesn't sit well. Like I don't want the Saudi Airlines Stadium or something along those lines. It just the, like you say, Aaron. Like it's different with a new stadium, but like with a traditional stadium, you you're kind of rubbishing hundreds of years of of, of just tradition. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And I think there'll be a lot of fans that actually, you know, do actually put up a, a fuss about it and. When you think about it, it'll probably be. I mean, let's just say it was to go ahead this summer and Darren Hills came out and, and unveiled the plans. It could arguably be the first thing that the ownership do that the fans really, really disagree with. You know, up until now, have they really put a foot wrong in terms of the, the decisions they've made off the pitch? I'd probably say no. It's certainly going to, you know, cause debate. Um, but I think, as you say, Sam, it, it, it's, it's for the good of the football club at the end of the day. Um, the way football's going, you know, I think in 10, 15 years, pretty much every single stadium in the country will be, you know, powered by something or or, or other. So very, very interesting, yeah. You're never going to let this down. I'm never going to let this down, am I? <laughs> no, because it, 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 it makes it seem like Alan Partridge when he's like travel report sponsored by Castro. <laughs> like that, it, it just it just makes it sound cheesy. Well, we'll see. We'll see. I'm sure that'll be... Um... An interesting debate amongst well, the motor fans. oils are available, by the way, not just <laughs> unless they sponsor us. Yeah, <laughs> email us, email us. Yes, <laughs> um, uh, look, it is going to be fascinating commercially. I think we, 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 I think everybody's kind of expressed on this podcast like it's it's going to be incredible to see what's going to happen. I always ask guests towards the end of the show, Aaron, what's going to happen in the next five years, and everyone kind of starts with their facial expression of like. I don't know. It's kind of like it's, it's just it, it, they can't almost imagine it. But I, I suppose we couldn't imagine what it was going to be like this season so far. A cup final, um, sitting just outside the top four. I, I do want to touch on the cup final because I want to get your opinion on this because I felt, and this is just my personal opinion. I don't know whether Sam agrees. I felt the club and the team didn't have the belief on the pitch to win that game against Manchester United. That was my personal opinion. I think they enjoyed the fact that they were there. I mean, the fans certainly did at Trafalgar Square. But when watching the game, I just thought there was a belief lacking that Newcastle could actually get over the line. And I don't think that that would happen again if that happened in 12 months' time. I don't know where you stand on that. Yeah, I, I think there's a there's a huge degree of truth to that. And, and I, I don't think it's necessarily you know, anybody's fault that that happened. I think it's just natural, you know, Newcastle United are going at their first cup final in, you know, 20 years. The the cup final came at a really, really bad time in terms of Newcastle's form and Manchester United's form. I think if that game had been played in December before the World Cup, you know, Newcastle would have stood a much better chance. I, I got the feeling being down in London for the full weekend, you know, we hardly saw a Manchester United fan the entirety of Saturday, even on the Sunday morning, walking up the ground, it was just a sea of black and white on Wembley Way. And I just think 
for Newcastle, and I wrote about this after after the game. For Newcastle, it was sort of just about getting there. They've waited so long for this, you know, cup final. So many fans got to experience a weekend in London supporting their team. The result, of course, mattered, but there'll be so many finals to come down the years. And as you say, Johnny, I think the next time they do go into a cup final, they'll be so much more prepared. They'll have so much more belief. They'll probably have a much, much better squad at their disposal. Um, so I think it was it was a you know a combination of things. I think you're absolutely spot on um, with your sort of assessment of it. But I think, as I say, there's going to be so many cup finals to come, you know, down the years. Hopefully, we don't have to wait as long as we waited this time around. I hope so, because up until the players come out on the pitch, you, you wouldn't have changed a thing about the whole weekend. I mean, as you well know, Aaron, me and Johnny were leathered at King's Cross. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, the, the, like you say, there wasn't a Man United fan in sight, and it was a complete Newcastle United takeover of, of London. So it, it's a difficult one. Like everything was 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 all set, and it like you say, I completely agree. It just came everything in the lead up on the pitch with Nick Pope, and it just came at the complete wrong time in the season. And and Sunday, obviously, this will probably come out after after we beat Man United two 0 at St James's Park. Um, should be a lot different. Yeah, absolutely. I think. Um, Newcastle have obviously refound their form a bit. Again, I think an international break has came at the worst time for them, just as it did with the World Cup, um, just as they were starting to find their feet. Manchester United have got a few little niggles, um, you know, especially in the midfield, a couple of people missing. So, and I think just being back at St James's Park, you know, they, they've proven over the years they can beat the top teams there. And I, and I think they'll give it a right good go Sunday. Um, but yeah, on the cup final, I think. Everybody who went down or everyone I've spoken to had a fantastic weekend, you know, regardless of the result. For that 90 minutes, it was obviously painful and, and, you know, it wasn't how anybody wanted it to go. But I think the Saturday being there, Trafalgar Square, the Sunday morning, the excitement, you know, it's it's whetted the appetite for, you know, years to come. We spoke, Aaron, after you did, uh, after you were part of the, the Chronicle team that went to uh, the Dolphin, I believe it was called, wasn't it, next to King's Cross, and you did the... Uh... Obviously, that show with there uh, with uh, with Bob Moncur, and I remember speaking to you on the tube when we were on the way to Trafalgar Square, and I asked you the question do you? before. Do you really yeah, remember? I do, that? I do, I do. Mm. I, do. I was that remember asking just, you a question just before you, just before you sort of lost your memory. Just, mm. just <laughs> because I, I remember I was like a giddy little school kid walking up the Trafalgar Square, I left Lee and Sam with the big crate of whatever beer we had at the time. But the, there was a question I did ask you on the tube. I don't know if you can remember. You probably can't. I said, what's the difference like for you? Because you're going to be a reporter being a, you're a fan as well, but your job is to report on this particular game. Can you enjoy yourself as much on the Saturday night? Can you, do you have to get your, essentially your professional head on early, early morning, Sunday morning, going, right, I need to be prepared. It's like any job. You don't tend to have a couple of, like loads of beers the night before on a school night, if we're putting it like that in inverted commas. <laughs> but what was your kind of, professional approach going into the game uh, against Manchester United and Wembley? Um, yeah, look, we got all sort of the important work stuff out the way early doors Saturday. We got the podcast done. And, and look, I, I did have quite a few beers at Trafalgar Square. I'm not going to lie about that at Saturday night. But um, obviously, as you say, Sunday morning, you know, the work heads on. We travelled to Wembley early, had Andrew Musgrove, you know, sticking a camera in my face at every avenue, making YouTube videos and, and Facebook videos. And then, you know, we were probably in the Wembley press box for about one o'clock with, with, you know, three hours before kickoff. During the game, you know, I was sat next to Keith Downey, who isn't even a Newcastle United supporter. He was getting very animated as if he was, you know, sitting there as a fan. Um, and I was probably the same, you know, you try and keep your, you know, your, your journalist head on, not your fan head. But it was really, really hard because, you know, I, I've covered games at Wembley before for, for obviously clubs that aren't Newcastle United and, and it was great, but it was just a surreal experience actually being there you know covering your castle and I will admit there was probably a, you know a big lump in my throat when the national anthem was being sung and honestly I think if they'd won it I would have really struggled to keep my composure I think I would have been you know tightening on the laptop through teary eyes but fantastic experience and, and you know hopefully I get to do it again in the next couple of years yeah that's what baffled me with Man United fans like there was because we, we, all right, we didn't leave straight away, did we, Johnny? But like, 
we, we left relatively quickly. Um, and there was Man United fans on our tube because they're on the tube home. Um, it was just bizarre. Like, if we had won it, we'd still be there now. Like, tops off and and and, and, and everything. It, it, it's just, it baffled me somewhat. And it just goes to show that there is something different about being a Newcastle United fan and, and belonging to, the, to this football club. And, um, of course, we all know where it went wrong is when you said the day before that you'd start Wilson over Isak. So it all went downhill after that. You know what it is? I'm, I'm really surprised that it's taken us 16 minutes for you to bring that up. I thought that would have been inside 30 seconds, if I'm honest. But uh, I'll admit, you, you, were, you were very much right on that, on that occasion. Yeah, that's all I needed. <laughs> Just going to clip that up. He's, it is funny, actually. Well, I'll mention Alex Isaac now because I think Sam wants his two minutes of fame where he goes, oh, I said Isaac was going to be amazing and uh, I wanted him in in the summer. I, I, to be honest with you, Aaron, I, do want, I don't watch foreign football. I, I think, like I said, I think the Premier League is the best league in the world. That, that's kind of my bread and butter, if I'm being honest. Um, but Sam, <clears throat> excuse me, did mention Isaac a lot at times. I remember when the, the news broke by, I think it was in Spain that it got broken, that um, that a bit had been accepted. I had to break the news to Sam. <laughs> I was on my way to um, Newcastle. Oh, we yeah, I was at work, before. wasn't I? I missed it. Yes. Yeah. yeah I remember so I, that, I, I, no? I remember texting Sam saying, looks like we got your boy. And he was like, what? So we just agreed to deal with Isaac. With and he was like, no way, no way. <laughs> but, um, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. I told you to F off. <laughs> <laughs> I said yeah. it on Sky, though, that he, he would be our... Aguero equivalent, and he's not there yet. But I think, Aaron, would you agree that signs are starting to show? Oh, absolutely. And it is funny because I think, obviously, we were in the Dolphin before, and, and Sam, you were in the minority who wanted Isaac to start. You know, even though Callum Wilson was going through that, you know, poor run of form, the consensus was still, you know, let's stick to what we know and play him. And, you know, we're sat here just over a month later, and I don't think there's many Newcastle United fans who you know, would really want Callum Wilson to come back in. It, it, it's really, really, obviously hindsight's a wonderful thing. If Isaac hadn't have got that injury at the start of the season, I think Newcastle United would be a lot higher in the league. And that's obviously saying something. I think he's slowly but surely adapting to the Premier League. Um, he's frighteningly good with the ball at his feet. He's, he's slender, but he's just, you know, very, very strong. Is he 100% fit? I'm not too sure. Eddie Howe keeps telling us that he's not. And then he keeps running himself into the ground. So I'm not I'm not too sure. But look, he's 23. He's already, you know, proven, you know, a very, very good Premier League striker. I think once he starts to hit, you know, 25, 26, just absolutely ridiculous. I think that's a good thing, though, as well, Aaron. If he's not 100% fit and he's doing this at whatever percentage Eddie Howe thinks he is at now, Let's say 60, 70 percent for argument's sake. There's still more to come from this lad, and I think that's I think that's going to be the really, really interesting point. But in terms of options, now we have got a bit more options. I know we sold Chris Wood, but that was it was a good deal all around. Let's be brutally honest with Newcastle. You know, we couldn't turn that down. Um, but when you've got Callum Wilson coming off the bench, Callum Wilson coming off the bench, where let's be honest, it used to be. X, Y, and Z. I don't, Dwight want to, Gale. I, don't want to dis, I don't want to disrespect players, but that, that was that, that's what it was twelve months ago. It was Dwight Gale coming on for Callum Wilson with 10, 15 minutes ago, just to run the clock down, or five minutes ago, just to run the clock down. Now it's a different kettle of fish. That that's also a great prospect for Eddie Howe. He has got a lot of options, and you throw into you throw Anthony Gordon into the mix. You throw Alan St. Maxman, Miguel Armoron in those attacking places. I haven't even talked about the, the midfield yet. There's, you've got Joe Linton potentially wanting to get back in and. Would you drop Joe Linton when he's when he's on the form that he's in? So competition for places for Eddie Howe is something that yes, he's probably gonna have to get used to throughout throughout his tenure at Newcastle. But if you can get used to it now, then make make, make it a bit easier for him in years to come. Yeah, absolutely. And look, I think even if you, you go back to the start of this season when they were a bit unlucky with injuries in certain positions, you look at the bench now, it's so much stronger than it was, you know, six, seven months ago. I think look let's just fast forward a year, you're probably going to be looking at the likes of Dan Byrne on the bench, maybe even Fabian Scher on the bench, long staff coming off the bench. You know, if they bring in six or seven players in the summer, you know, if, if they're sort of building this big squad for a European push, 
that bench next year is all of a sudden going to be filled with players that are probably starting right now. So it will, you know, Amanda Stavey's made it clear that it will take a couple of transfer windows for Newcastle to get where they want to be. But in terms of what they've got now, as you say, even just bringing Anthony Gordon off the bench, you know, a £40 million signing, they've done fantastically well um, spending-wise. And I think, you know, if they can keep, you know, the recent run of injuries has been quite good compared to the start of the season. If they can keep that going between now and May, they've got a huge chance of finishing in the top four. Yeah, massive. Um, I'm looking ahead to the summer. Um, a player that um, you're wrong about again, um, because you want him, uh, is Scott McTominay. Um, explain yourself. Look, uh, me and Andrew spoke about this on the, on the Chronicle podcast the other day, and... I just can't understand negativity around it. Yes, I get he's not, you know, a flashy, sexy player. He's not going to get you 15 goals a season, but he improves that team. You know, I don't know what you think, but I think he's better than Longstaff, which is if Newcastle United are going to be are going to be playing Champions League football next season, or even Europa League football, they're going to need a huge squad. And I think adding Scott McTominay, who's played two in the games for Manchester United under four different managers across six, seven years is a very, very good deal if it could be done for the right price. And can I just say, can I just say that Sam Molnar was watching the Everything's Black Mike podcast the other day and made the claim that Jeff Hendrick would be his preferred... No. Uh, oh, is he going to back on this? He said he would prefer Jeff Hendrick. And look, no disrespect to Jeff Hendrick, but come on, Sam. Uh, yeah, that comment didn't get read out, but I saw you giggling at it, which um, filled me with joy. Um, I mean, I, I appreciate Scott McTominay's just had an absolute worldy couple of games for Scotland as well. Big, big frame, big unit. I don't know. I just, I just can't see it, and I don't know if he is, if he is that good and that capable. Why would Man United want to sell to, in essence, a rival now? Yeah, no, I, I completely understand that, and and you know, I got quite a lot of. You know, negative comments for saying that I wouldn't mind him at Newcastle, and a lot of people made that point. Um, but look, as I said on Monday, I bet some Arsenal fans were thinking that about Gabby Jesus and Zinchenko in the summer. Or oh, why are we buying, you know, City or Liverpool or Man United's rejects? Well, because they've been there and done it. So, look, is he is he the player that I want more than anyone in the world? No, but do I understand the sort of the hysteria around potentially signing him? I just don't get it. I think. I think he's a decent player. Yeah, I think it's certainly going to cause debate. Um, Anthony Gordon did as well, though, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's what I was thinking. That's what I was thinking. Look, the Scott called Scott will certainly cause debate. That's all. That's all we will say. I think I, I, I'm kind of okay about it. If he was, to, if he was to sign, I can kind of understand it. I think I always would say, would he, does he improve our starting eleven or best eleven? I, I would I would argue to say no on that at this moment in time, but under Eddie Howe, getting the right coaching, maybe a new you know lease of life in a different area. If he, if he has a couple of good performances early on, Newcastle fans will forget about the fact that he probably played for Man United, and it happens. It does happen. Same Anthony Gordon, you know the reception yeah. he and Harris Nashby got before that cup semi final second leg. It was it was almost forgotten about that he was this dirty little rat who played for Everton. Like let's be honest, that's how a lot, a lot of people thought. That's a lot of people thought about Anthony Gordon beforehand. Um, I think though that particular position isn't Newcastle's priority, in my in my opinion. I still think the Musa Diaby link, if that is true, in terms of a winger. I know almiron has been amazing, but I just think there's a gap there for an unbelievable winger. To help Isaac even more, because if if you're looking at Saint Maxon's stats, they're not good enough. They're just not good enough. Great player when he wants to be, but they're not good enough. Aaron, what's the latest with this Musa DRB link? Is there any truth in it? And it does it depend yeah. on Newcastle finishing the top four? Look, I think that's going to be a huge factor, not just for the DRB deal, but I think for a lot of the targets that they're probably going to eye the caliber of players they're going to be able to attract if they're just fourth, not fifth, is quite scary. DRB himself has came up plenty of times and said that. You know, the reason he stayed at Bayer Leverkusen is because they got Champions League football. I think there's going to be a lot of suitors, not just Newcastle, but they really, really liked him last summer. You know, the money just wasn't there to do it. Bayer didn't want to sell. Um, I I think personally the priority is probably one more midfielder, but I, I completely agree that 
a right-sided attacker is also, you know, very, very high on the list. Big fan of Miggy. I think he's done fantastically well, but until he can start to show that he can do that, you know, for a full season, not just four or five months, I think there is a gap there that he potentially loses his space to somebody like Diaby or, you know, a, a player of, you know, real, real quality. I personally would absolutely love to see Mr. Diaby there. Um, Chabi Alonso, the new Leverkusen man, just is very, very keen to keep him, but I think Newcastle definitely go back in this summer. Mm, wouldn't say no to that. Um, I, I think since January and whatnot, we've been we've been told that Newcastle want a, a centre mid, and Madison's a name that's just not going away. But I'd like to think I personally would want to see a defensive midfielder that can sit in front of the back four to allow Bruno to get forward a bit more. Um, so, so whilst you were slamming me for wanting Jeff Hendrick back on 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 your podcast uh, earlier in the week, my my serious comment, which was also not read out, Mister Musgrove, if you're watching, um, I, I name dropped two names that I want um, in Ibrahim Singari and Sandro Tonali. They would obviously cost a lot more than Scott McTominay would, I would imagine. But is the thinking that maybe it's only going to be one, maybe two big money signings and then the rest they'll be looking for value elsewhere? Yeah, look, I think I think one thing's for certain that there's definitely money to spend and they purposely kept their powder quite dry in January. They could quite easily have went out and rushed and got another centre midfielder to replace um, John Joe Shelby. They could have easily, you know, gone and got a last minute deal to try and bring someone in that was going to be sort of a like, like for like replacement for Chris Wood. They know that this summer is absolutely huge. If they finish in the top four, they need, you know, pretty much a new six, seven players, I'd say, of real quality brought in to not only strengthen the first team, but to strengthen the bench. I can see big money spent on a centre midfielder. I think they'll potentially go out and buy a real top class left back, you know, for as good as Dan Burns being, he's just not sort of a natural there. Um, but they'll definitely try and do it sensibly. I don't think they'll, you know, go absolutely overboard with with the spending. But I think they'll be they'll, there's there's money to spend it. They need to spend it if if they're finishing anywhere near the top four. It's, uh, I, I, we'll go back on that top four debate in a second. But I think the difference is this time in this summer we've got a Dan Ashworth and a Darren Eels in our back pocket who are two very experienced. Uh, to exp- to experience people in their in their in, in, in their obviously in their field, and I, I think you can tell that everybody just trusts them. And I think if people if other clubs talk to them, they know they're having a serious conversation and a professional conversation, where it probably wasn't always like that in previous regimes, which I'll not go on about. However, the top four race is heating up just a little bit. Obviously, this has been recorded before Newcastle took on Manchester United. Uh, Everton versus Tottenham and Manchester City versus Liverpool. But we'll, see, we'll, we'll throw Brighton in the mix as well because we don't know how they're going to get. Got it. I think got, you got it. Uh, yeah, I think they've got Brentford who are also on the same points as, as Brighton mm-hmm. as well and Liverpool. So we, we will mention that as well. For me, I'm not too necessarily concerned about Spurs if I'm honest because they're just so inconsistent. I've got the saying, and Sal knows exactly what I'm going to say. Spurs are being Spursy. <laughs> they are. They will. I said that when they were when they. I think any time they, they lose a game or they concede a goal, it's it's that's the same. So for me, I think it's Man United, Newcastle, Liverpool. They're the three, and obviously two can only fit into those two positions. Especially if Newcastle can get a win over Manchester United, they would actually be third for at least twenty four hours. Now I'm hoping that's the case when you listen to this podcast, boys and girls. Um, <laughs> With your experienced professional head on, Aaron, how likely is it that Newcastle finish in the top four? And is it important that the next three games are crucial because Liverpool take on City, Chelsea and Arsenal all in one week? If Newcastle can, say, pick up six out, six points, seven points out of nine and Liverpool only pick up, say, one to four, is that enough? Or do Newcastle have to be looking at, the, at a certain target in those three games? Look, I, I think... I know exactly what you're saying about Spurs. I don't, you know, from a Newcastle point of view, it couldn't be it couldn't be going more wrong there for Spurs and right for Newcastle. You know, Conte slagging the players, then leaving their director who's trying to replace them, getting a worldwide ban. You know, Newcastle really should be 
trying to put Spurs away. Next month is huge because, as you say, Liverpool's one of games. Newcastle has obviously got big, big fixtures both home and away. This time next month, we could generally be sitting there here saying, you know, they've already guaranteed qualification for at least, you know, the conference or maybe Europa. Um, with my, you know, experience head on, as you say, um, I personally think we'll finish in the top four. I think Liverpool have stuttered this season. They can't find a rhythm. Spurs, as you say, are being very Spursy. Brighton up, Brighton up, you know, do actually worry me because of this run of games that they're putting together. Um, but I think Newcastle United, as we said earlier in the show, they've just found their feet at the right time. If they can pick up where they left off after, you know, this warm weather trip, which they usually do, you know, every time they go away on these sort of breaks, they do tend to come back and, and actually hit the ground running. So, you know, I'm going to sit here and, and, I, and I personally think they will finish in the top four. I mean, what a week in store, because after this couple of weeks of nothingness with the international break, then bam, 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 three games in, what, six days? Man United, West Ham away, Brentford away. That's a huge week. It could either be looking very, very good or it could be fizzling out again. Um, do you think whilst we've not had European football to play this season, we've not had FA Cup football to play in the second half of this season, so the fatigue element shouldn't really be there, but the problem is how it doesn't really rotate his squad that much. Would that worry you in any way? as we get to the to the kind of one last push potentially as you say i think they're in a you know very privileged position to only have the the premier league to focus on but a lot of these players as you say haven't been rotated have carried you know a lot of little niggles i mean fabian share every single game is the walking wounded dan burns had that shoulder strapped up for about two years callum wilson for whatever reason just can't you know seem to shake whatever sort of viral or, or niggle he had in the last couple of um, months. I think you look at that team and and there's a lot of tired bodies there uh, and not a lot of depth to come in, as we saw it at Sheffield uh, Wednesday in the FA Cup. So, yeah, look, it, on one hand, it, it is a concern, but I think, as you say, only having Premier League games to focus on, once they get this sort of three games and six games out of the way, it's looking a lot of sort of lighter in April and, and then towards May. Yeah, I, I have to be honest. I've I've been banging the drum about Brighton. I have to be honest. I think not many teams have really worked them out this year. They might have lost games this season, but they've never been battered this season. I think their heaviest defeats three one. They tend Brighton. to fizzle out though, don't they? They normally like shape up like they're ever going to have. They're going to do something, but they tend to yeah. fizzle out. But we've got them to play at home as well already, haven't we? I, I, I think I think the, the thing with Brighton, I think that they might fizzle out is because they've got this FA Cup semi final. And don't be surprised if they beat Manchester United, by the way, because if because Man United are playing like Europa League games, and that's not a gimme for Man United as much as they will probably make it out with their fan pages and fan groups and whatever, saying that oh yeah, we're, we're going to be taking on Man City in the FA Cup final. I know Sheffield United will have a, a part to say about that, but yeah, I'll keep an eye on Brian. I just don't think anyone's really working out. We were looking to get a point of the Amex in the second like, second game of the season, but it was it is, yeah, it was it was, it was it's going to be interesting to see what happens there, but. Um, you talk about the walking wounded. I know Sam hates the international break. I actually think it came at a good time. I know we won two on the chop with Forrest and Wolves, and I and I completely understand it. Saying, "Well, you want to keep that momentum going." I actually think it'll help the players long term. I think you go into the maybe May onwards, where you're probably going to have to play, you know, five games, five games in eight. Well, probably six or seven games in eight, or maybe even six games in the. It may be in April. I think that might just help me. The fact that 90% of these players have had two weeks off, like Bruno not getting picked for Brazil, was a massive, massive bonus if I'm in, like as a biased Newcastle fan. Um, do you how, how well has that warm weather training camp gone from what you know, Aaron? Do you think Eddie Howe got what he wanted from that, or do you think do you think he would have liked maybe a bit more time in Dubai? I'm sure like everybody does nowadays. <laughs> yeah, uh, look, uh, as I said earlier, these warm weather trips, Eddie Howe insist that they're football related and I'm not too sure whether going to Saudi Arabia is really football related but they always seem to do really well after them you know after the um the last game you know Eddie Howe give them you know three or four days break we saw obviously like uh, Bruno and Joel and jetting off for their families which is obviously good for them um as far as we're aware no new injury doubts I'm not too sure whether Anthony Gordon's going to be back but you know the break certainly done him good given that he's 
you know, already sort of touch and go for Man United on Sunday. Um, I agree and complete with your point. I think with the run of games that we've got coming up, it can be a blessing. I'm just always wary of them sort of interrupting a good run of form for, you know, two weeks of not playing. But um, if they pass anything to go by, they'll, they'll come back ready. And, and I'm sure Eddie Howell have them, you know, drilled as he always does. Yeah, I saw Bruno jet off to the Maldives for a couple of days before yeah. heading out to, to to Dubai. I mean, imagine just jetting off to the Maldives just for a couple of days, yeah, just just, just, just for a weekend in the Maldives. I mean, it, it's a far cry from having a city break in Stoke. <laughs> but, but, you know, fair enough. He deserves it. God love him. Um, with Almiron, lost his place against Wolves, came on super sub, made that impact. Um, alluding to new signings and whatnot, I think that may be his future role as the squad evolves and more strength in depth and competition for places. How f- are we expecting him to be fit for these run of games, three games in six days, or is he not there yet? And does he walk just straight back into the team now? Um, you know, from what I understand, he's he's been training with the team this week. Um, he stayed back when they were in Dubai and did sort of solo stuff. Does he walk back into the team? If I'm honest, I don't think he does. I think this team's been playing so well. And I personally love Almiron coming off the bench because, you know, who if you're a defender who's played 70 minutes, you're shattered. The player you don't want to be having to chase around is Miguel Almiron. So... Jacob Murphy, for all, you know, myself and a lot of Newcastle fans have probably given stick over the years. He's arguably earned his spot in this team. I think he's, you know, looked very, very um, dangerous in recent games, you know, despite not sort of finding the net or assisting. I think he's looked very, very positive. Um, I think the real question about who starts is actually down the other side because with Joel Linton returning, do you play him down the left? Do you stick him in the middle and sort of drop? Long stuff out. I don't think you can really drop Willock out. Um, so for me, I, I, I don't think Miggy comes straight back in, no. And I think that's absolutely fine. I think having a player of his quality off the bench is fantastic. As you say, Sam, I think, you know, six months to a year down the line, that probably will be his role. But, you know, that's just a sign of the squad getting much better. That's what you want. That is what you want. You, we've been talking, we're, we're talking about incomings. We've been talking about loads of incomings. And I'm sure you will be asked thousands and thousands of times, Aaron, over the summer that who we're buying, who we're getting, X, Y, and Z. But for all these incomings, there's going to be departures. Now, for me, I think we'll see a few departures, but I think there may be one or two surprise departures as well along the way. Could one of those, one or two of those su- surprise departures include Alan St. Maxon? Yes, most definitely, I think. Um for all that, he used to be the absolute go-to man in this team. He just, for whatever reason, it isn't working. He looks restricted, I think, in any how team. When he's sort of, you know, got to be a team player and he's got to defend and, you know, he isn't just allowed to take his man on four or five times. He's another one who came back into the team um, and then, you know, has, has sort of fallen back out of it again. Two years ago, it seemed sort of unfathomable that he would go and fans would sort of be okay with it. I think if, if you've got a decent offer in the summer, is anybody really going to complain? As you said at the top of the show, Johnny, his numbers aren't good enough. He doesn't score enough goals. Um, What's a decent offer? What? So they, they paid, what, 16, going up to 20 for him. Would you get, would you get 30 million for him? 40 million? I, I would I hope so. How much do we pay for Anthony Gordon? Yeah, well, yeah, 40, 40 mil, I think. I think he's a better player than Anthony Gordon, personally, but I just think 40 million is a huge outlay for an attacker that doesn't really score many goals. Um, if, if the right offer came in, I, I, I certainly wouldn't wouldn't be, you know, instantly turning it down. I think he's been fantastic for us over the years. I just don't think it's going to work in this system for him. And I don't know what you boys think about it, because I think this is another one that will split opinion, but... For me, I just think he, he's had so many chances in this team and, and for whatever reason, he just can't take it. Uh, you're wrong. But, uh, <laughs> no, I just, I don't know, I love him. And, like, he needs to stay fully fit and get firing. I think the most frustrating thing about his whole Newcastle career was after that Wolves game where he tore City a new backside. Yeah. 
scored that absolutely world class volley to equalise against Wolves and then gets injured. And then he's out of the team. And then he can't get back in the team because we're playing well. <sighs> the, 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 he's, it, it's there. It is there. And I, I, I just, I'm not convinced about that he can't fit into an Eddie Howe team. I just I just want to see him succeed so bad because the love he has for the club is is pretty unrivaled considering when he joined us and how he stuck with us and how much how many times he's got us out of the the brown stuff when things were were going bad. No, I, I completely get that and I, and you know maybe it is recency bias that I'm sort of playing him down. He's done fantastic things in this team. He was, you know, one of the few shining lights in the Steve Bruce era, um, as you say, dragged us out of the mire a lot of times. But for me, I just think, I get what you're saying, he's fantastic at the start of the season. He came back to fitness. He was really, really good for three or four games about a month or two ago before the cup final. But then it just and then it just goes again. And I just think, until you... If, if, if he plays consistently well between now and the end of the season, fair enough. But I just think with Alton Maximum, you can never guarantee that you're going to get the same maxi every week. If we saw the same maxi that we saw against City every other week, you'd be laughing. But I just, I just think he goes missing in this team too often. I don't think Eddie Howe trusts him in some games, I have to be honest. And I'm not going to say frustrating because I think that's the wrong word, but I don't know what the right word is. When we played Man United at Wembley and Diogo Dallo got taken off at half-time and Aaron Wan-Bissaka came on, I knew that St. Maxim was not getting the better of him. I just knew he wasn't getting the better of him. Um, Aaron Wan-Bissaka, love him or hate him at Man United, is a very, very good one-on-one defender because he can get a good tackle and he very rarely loses those battles. And I just knew that it didn't matter what St. Maxim was going to do. Unfortunately, Aaron Wan Bissaka was going to have his number, which was a bit of a straight, a bit frustrating. And to be fair, I had a pretty good view, but I was right next to where on I was on his side for, for where I was sitting for the game at, at, at Wembley. But the the one thing I would mention, obviously, you're saying forty million for Maxi. Is there anybody else, anybody else that they're thinking, oh, that could be a bit of a surprise? Because I'm looking at, I'm still looking at some players that Rafa had, i.e. Dubravka, i.e. Lascelles, i.e. Who else is there? Obviously, Kieran, well, like Kieran Clark's, I think, obviously going to be out of contract. Jeff Hendrick's still going to be Isaac out. Hayden might have to come back because Norwich aren't going to get promoted, really, are they? So Hayden could be back uh, in the squad. And they've still got a year left, hasn't he? So, yeah. So that's going to be interesting again. But these are players that haven't got a future. Then another player that hasn't got a future is Ryan Fraser by the sound of it. And he's still in contract in 2025. I'm sure that he'll be one of the, three, one of the first players looking for a move in the summer as well. Yeah, uh, you know, really, really surprising that Ryan Fraser didn't leave in, in January. You know, I was pretty much told that he was all set to go and then Newcastle didn't let him. And then all of a sudden Eddie House dropped him. I don't think it's a very it's a very pleasant um, relationship that they've got anymore. In terms of outgoings, the one thing, I, I, it's not an issue, but I think the one worry is that they don't have many sellable assets. Maxi is probably one you could get a, a good return for. Other than that, Dubravka, you're not going to get too much if he goes. A lot of players that are going to come back um, or go, oh, oh, are you not going to get pennies if that? Do you then look to you know someone like Miggy if you need to raise funds? And not that they're going to need to raise money, but if a good offer came in for Almiron, would they be tempted? If a good offer came in for Callum Wilson, would they be tempted? I don't know. I'd, I think there is going to be a lot of outgoings, but in terms of how much money they generate, it's it's not going to be a lot. No, we, we all know the the sort of obvious ones. You dumb it, you Gillespie's, um, Matt Ritchie, who I, th- I think we should mention separately because for me, one of the most important Newcastle players from the past ten years. Absolutely, um, he's given us a lot of fantastic moments. So it's absolutely brilliant sitting so close to the pitch that we that we do at St James's Park because all you can hear when he comes on the pitch is just him shouting at the ref, at the castle players, at, at how it's just absolutely fantastic. Um, and yeah, I think he does deserve to be in a separate pile because he might not have the legs anymore, but he's been such a good servant and, and it will be really, really sad to see him go. He's doing his coaching badges at the club at the minute. Um, he's doing a lot of sort of work in and around the academy. So 
if he does decide to hang up his boots, I know he's probably a bit too young, but if he if he does sort of maybe maybe he could stick around and under sort of house team. Um but yeah, you're looking elsewhere. It's, it is the likes of Dummett, you know, Kieran Clark out of contract, Gillespie out of contract. Um, not too much in the way of sort of sellable assets. Remember the days of trying to sell Henry Sire? <laughs> <laughs> Never did, did we really? God knows, God knows. I hope he's doing all right. Um, <laughs> we talked, we talked briefly about Eddie Howe there. Is the only thing stopping Eddie Howe getting manager of the season is if Mikel Arteta wins the league with Arsenal? Yeah, I think if, if Arsenal win the league, it's it's Arteta's. I think if Brighton somehow get top four, it, it's probably De Um But other than that, I think he, he's a shoe in I think Newcastle United get into a top four in a cup final and he doesn't win manager of the year. It's an absolute crime considering it's his first full season in the job. Um yeah, I think, as you say, I think it all depends on whether uh, Arsenal can last it out at the top. Just to, to go back on something we mentioned before, because it involves Eddie Howe, is, is the Ryan Fraser thing, because like people might forget, at the end of last season, he was ahead of Miggy. He, he was keeping Miggy out of the team, Ryan Fraser was. And then, all of a sudden, he's been frozen out, and he was frozen out ages before like people really cottoned on to the fact that he had been frozen out. So, like, do we know what's happened there? Is it like a bit of a recurrence of the whole Bournemouth thing they had, or it, it just seems to have gone from hero to zero with Fraser very, very quickly, even though it's dragged out for a while now? From from Fraser's side, um, what I've been told is that he feels he's been very unfairly treated, as far as he is aware. Or as far as he feels, he was still training the same. He was still, you know, he wasn't refusing to play. He wasn't unhappy that he wasn't starting every week. Um, so it's very, very murky what's happened. I think in the summer, um, he will definitely have his say on the matter. I think he isn't going to go quietly when it does happen, um, you know, from what I've been told. But as you say, Sam, a couple of months ago, people started noticing that, oh, you know, he wasn't making match day squads. We were asking how about it. Eddie Howe was saying he's he's fully fit, which sort of gave the game away that something was up. But even as far back as November, really, he wasn't getting a look in, which is really, really strange. Um, maybe it's a re- reoccurrence of the Bournemouth thing, but for, certainly from Fraser's side, he feels like um, he, he's sort of been unfairly treated. What's the word? What's the word? Um, I'm trying to think of the word. and it'll come, it'll come to me. It'll come to me. I'm thinking of the fact that it was the it was the other way around essentially with with, with Ryan Fraser uh, at Bournemouth and when Eddie Howe needed him, he wasn't there, and now he doesn't need him. So it's, 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 uh, just can't think of the word off the top of my head. And maybe Sam might think of it and let me know as soon as possible. As in, help us, Sam, please. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, we've spoken to our previous guests, Aaron, for the last. Probably last couple, last couple of weeks, really. I was going to say last couple of months, but probably last couple of weeks where we've asked who's the player of the season because everybody's pretty much said different players. I don't, unless Sam can remember somebody that said the same player as somebody else because there is just so many candidates right now. I know there'll probably be loads of honourable mentions, but can you put one name and go, he's my player of the season so far? <laughs> If I if good in my head, I think I'd maybe say Nick Pope. I know the last couple of weeks haven't gone as, as smoothly as we would have liked, but I think to have the best defence in the league, and not just by one or two goals, by we're talking seven or eight goals here, he would probably be mine. But then I think Miggy has got to be up there with a shout. I think a lot of people say that. Fabian Cher has been an absolute rock. Botman has fitted in effortlessly. Joe Linton is an eight out of ten every week. You could have, as you say, and I'm sure you have when you've asked these guests five or six different answers. Um, and I don't really think you can really complain with any of them, to be honest. No. You said Bruno or Longstaff, and I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> or Trippier. Yeah. Or Trippier. Yeah, or, yeah, exactly. Nick or, Jamal, or Jamal LaSalle with them two yellow cards. Two yellows, yeah. Does, does that like, kind of sort of find one for me, like the, the kind of dark arts that Newcastle have now 
kind of brought into their game, which you know all the top teams do, and and there must be some influence from uh, Diego Simeone with Eddie Howe. Um, does that kind of show like where we really, really want to be that we're doing this already and trying to get under the top team's skin already? We look at the reception like cast your mind back to Anfield. Newcastle were booed off the pitch at Anfield for, yeah. for, for essentially just doing what all the top teams do. I think I think I think it's shocked quite a few teams that you know nice Eddie Howe has turned up at their stadium and actually his team are you know, just an absolute bunch of bastards. I think there's probably four or five different games you can sort of cast your mind back to. Liverpool being one, Arsenal away, Chelsea at home, where really, you know, Newcastle United were, were sort of seeing out games so well. I really, really love that Eddie Howe calls it game management rather than time wasting or shit shithousery. I think it's a really nice way to sort of disguise it. Um, and look, I think... There's so many players in this team that can do it. Trippier, obviously, you know, learned from the master and Simeone. Lascelles has proven that he doesn't have to be on the pitch and he can, you know, have his uh, influence. Fabian Cher, Anthony Gordon, Jolinton is a really, really sneaky one as well. Oh, um, yeah. Which, which is what we, which is what we like. You know, we absolutely hate it when these players are playing against us, but when they're in a black and white shirt, you know, you absolutely love it. So I don't think there'll be any complaints from from any of us really. Just finally, obviously, we're heading into April, probably into the early stages of April when this podcast comes out. Um, what has been the standout moment so far this season? God, there's been so many. Um, for me, I really, really loved the um, second semi final at St James's Park. I just thought it was absolutely brilliant and so much riding on it, the way it panned out. Um, yeah, I think the Carabao Cup final would have would have absolutely taken it if they'd won. I think it's a very very close second just being there. But yeah, that night it's I love I love it when St James's Park is like that on those evening games. Um, so yeah, I think that that just takes it for me. Is that yours, Sam? From that game, I loved how nervous we all were, even though like Southampton needed two goals to take it to yeah. extra time. But we were all absolutely terrified yeah. with five it's, minutes it's, to go. We forgot that there were actually two goals ahead and everyone yeah. thought that there was only a goal in it, really. Yeah. No, my, my, Johnny, to answer your question, mine was Wolves at home for very personal reasons. That was my little lad's first game and Almiron got the winner right in front of us and Almiron's his favourite player. So, yeah, that that was that was that um, that's going to take some beating. Well, he's going to have a good view against Southampton, isn't he, at the end of the month? So I'm sure we'll see what happens with that. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. <laughs> Aaron, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the crew in the morning show. We always seem to talk to you in a very positive way when it comes to Newcastle United. So I hope the next time we do, we're in the Champions League. We've either finished third or fourth. We should DRB, James Madison are on their way. And we're talking about how Eddie Howe has managed the season. Yeah, I think I think you've got the crystal ball out there. I think that's that all sounds very very feasible to be honest. I think we'll, I'm sure we'll all take it. Sam, like everybody listen to this podcast. Oh, everyone knows what to do by now. The links are all in the description. If you're listening on iTunes, hit the five star review, and if you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button. Fantastic. For myself, Jonathan Greer, my co-host Sam Mulner, and today's guest Aaron Stokes. We'll see you all very soon. <laughs>